I'm just going to do a little bit of a intro intro first. Right, hello. So we've got a different vehicle for you today. Uh, something for you to look around. A uh, very, very nice setup. This is towards, if you followed my YouTube from the very, very beginning, uh, all on the same kind of themes of the Land Rover strip back basic vehicle towing your, your pod, your trailer, your living accommodation behind it, um, which makes it very, very versatile in that you've still got a capable vehicle and you've got your base camp all, you know, you can divide it, you can bring it together however you want to use it. So let's bring you in, have a look and run through it. Everyone, this is Tim, as you can see, one of my Patreons sporting the Bug Out Vehicles UK hoodie and he's brought us a lovely, lovely winterised, uh, waterproofed um, Wolf 90. So do you want to take us through a little bit on what it is and why you've got it? Yeah, so the vehicle itself as a base vehicle, she is a uh, 1999 Defender 90 Wolf winterised wader. So she's um, ex-Royal Marines, she was 30 Commando 1 section, so she was basically uh, a driver's car around the head, a HQ for Royal Marines. Um, winterized and, and waterproof basically means that um, certain things have been changed on the vehicle to allow them to do certain tasks. So um, the most notable you'll see is the the teapot everyone's got on the top that you see, uh, on the snorkel. This is um, part of the, the waterproofing kit. So it's a Donaldson air filter that stops waves crashing over. So when they do beach landings and they come off of the ramp, um, the bow wave that comes up over won't get taken down into the um, intake. There is a um, a spiral vent in there that forces the air centrifugally out, so any water that does make it in gets spun out and then drops off this little um, water spout that's on the side, so that um, if anything did get inside, it would mostly exit before it went into the vehicle. So the other things that happen uh, that, that this has got that's not standard for for uh, waterproofing specifically is the alternator's got a waterproofing kit that goes to it. The diff breathers and the diff has a switch set under here where you switch the pipes around right at the back of the, of the um, engine bay. Um, at the moment, normal day-to-day -day driving, they run in through the tank breather. Um, when you want to go uh, wading, you unclick it, you click it into the um, uh, wading kit, basically. It runs up this, there's a centre pipe here, and that runs the diff breathers all the way up to the top. So your diff breathers go all the way up. Um, the other parts, the other changes to the engine, so the engine's quite unique, she is 24 volt being a wolf. Um, the front timing case, um, wading plug is not there, they've welded it up and put a pin prick, so they don't have to worry about getting out and putting wade, uh, wading plugs in. There is a wading plug still under the uh, bell housing, so you can still have to put the wading plug there. Um, other than that, winterization wise, it's all in the dash. Um, Rich will have taken some, shot, some shots that you'll see in B-roll, there's um, a central pod and everything is waterproofed within there. And you uh, you put a cover on it, which is basically like putting a big condom over the front of the electric pod. Um, you can still turn the key and see all the lights on the dash, um, but it waterproofs absolutely everything. Um, the only part of the engine that needs um, power is the stop solenoid. So that's the only part of the engine that has power um, requirement. So it, 300 TDIs are built basically to be bulletproof. And the alternator connections, we've got two connections for the alternator so that when you go wading, you swap the red and the blue connections over it. That removes the alternator from the battery power, turning off the alternator so when it gets submerged, it doesn't burn itself out. 
And then uh, we've got over in this corner here. I'll just come right. These are the diff breather pipes. You need a pointy stick. <laughs> I do need a pointy stick. Uh, these are the diff breather pipes. So we've got a blue pipe for standard driving, and this is the red pipe that would be for wading. So what, what, what you do is you disconnect the connection here, you slip it off, and you quick fit it onto that one. That sends the um, the diffs up into the air intake. There you go. So the final thing, this is part of the winterization kit. So this is a Webasto diesel heater. It uh, sounds absolutely terrible. Sounds like a massive jet engine. It's, uh, if you've got your normal Chinese diesel heaters, this one's about, uh, this is a 12 kilowatt diesel heater, not a, a, a two or a five like normal, or even an eight that you can get in some bigger ones. It's a 12 kilo, kilowatt diesel heater. The exhaust vents straight down. It's piped into the coolant for the engine and it's a preheater, but also the, um, coolant feeds a six inch radiator that sits underneath the battery compartment and warms the batteries and then a second pipe goes back and feeds two uh, three feet long radiators under the, the passenger seats in the back and that keeps the cab warm um, they are rated to minus 40 degrees cent uh, celsius so they can go down even as a soft top so the other part of the soft top is she's got a second thermal lining inside and we'll show you that in a second um, second thermal lining inside that um, insulates uh, from obviously heat and from cold so uh, that keeps them nice and toasty as you see the Royal Marines running around in uh, short sleeves in their landies in snow and you think what's going on it's because they're cooking inside because they've got their, their radiators going. So that's one thing that most people don't get with the Land Rovers is the thing because it's a soft top instantly it's colder and from experience the soft tops are actually warmer once they've got the uh, insulation kit in because of having the instead of not having two mil of aluminium with zero kind of insulation whatsoever you've got a canvas and an insulation kit and it's trapping pockets of air so it is i think the soft top 90s and 110s especially the wolves are probably the best land rovers that land rover ever made just purely because it's got the right combination of the thicker chassis the heavier duty suspension it's got the roll cage it's got the tdi engine that's been even more bomb proof it's it's everything that land rover did right in my opinion i know people like evolution and they like the electronics and they like the traction controls and stuff but for an end of days vehicle this will run on anything and keep running Right, so as previously explained, she's a, a winter wader, which means that she gets a, a thermal lining on the inside. So within the vehicle, you can see there is a second skin. This is about uh, about six mil thick, um, and it's a thermal lined. It's got a, a flap that comes down and Velcro's on the inside, and then your, obviously your cover comes down on the outside. With it being a wolf, it's got a PVC hood as well. Um, underneath, you can see the, the hood doesn't have standard hood loop, uh, loops that uh, Land Rovers usually come with. What it does have is it's got the Remus upgrade, which means they've put the roll cage right the way through, and the roll cage has actually become the hood loops in the back. So the roll cage is here, it runs up the inside, comes across, but bolted to the roll cage through some uh, bushings that go through the hood are these ski racks. So because they're um, winterized and they're for Royal Marines, Royal Marines obviously have to be able to go anywhere on the planet. So they have ski racks so they can drop their skis on top. I've modified my ski rack slightly with some Unistrut to allow me to stick the solar panel on the top. The solar panel electrics come down through here, behind the spare and up through the radio uh, holes in the side of the camera, uh, side of the hood, which actually makes it nice and easy, nice and tidy, and uh, you don't actually notice any spare wires hanging. Um, in the back, I've built a small area with a small house battery so that I can do camping and I've got a, a battery that's fed by the solar panel up there it's a 75 amp hour battery don't need it to do much don't need it to last long just need it to be there if I need if I absolutely need something and then because she's a soft top we all know what Land Rovers are like and what uh, people are like in the UK if they see something in the back they'll cut through the canvas and they'll just take what they want so um, I've also built a strong box I say strong box it's just made out of plywood but out of sight people can't see it and they can't um, break in they won't break in just to take something inside the back so anything that's valuable day to day gets stored out of the way so it's out of sight so the trailer itself as a base is um, a 1986 Sankey um, she's from uh, the Royal Marines same as the Land Rover but she's from a different section in the Royal Marines um, she's from 
I believe it's 4 2 Commando Royal Marines, but I could be wrong. Um, she's obviously 1986, that makes her 34 years old or something. And uh, yeah, she's she's been well maintained for what she was. She was a farm, she was used as a farm trailer for a lot of her life. So, <clears throat> so there's a lot of things that need maintenance the lights need maintenance, the brakes need maintenance, and the axles themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. COVID. But, COVID, yeah. <laughs> Um, but for what she is, you can pick these up for between six and eight hundred quid, depending on what you want to get and how good a condition they are. Parts are readily available, with the exception of the brakes. So the, this is drums. The shoes on these are series axles, and uh, the series three and the Sankey shoes are slightly different, and they're no longer available. So the only um, prospect you can get to get your brakes done is you have to have your shoes relined. You can't just go and buy new shoes. You actually have to go and pay someone to rebuild them for you. Not much, but still more expensive than buying new shoes. It might. So moving on to the trailer now from the back of the wolf. Uh, British uh, military uses the NATO hitch and uses the NATO uh, lunette ring for off-roading. And it's the best option that you can get for the combination that we've got. It's probably the best option you can get for off-roading in the UK. There are some Australian equivalents for like Patriot campers. I don't quite see how they would be any better than a lunette ring in this case. Um, with a Sankey, the um, prime mover has to, uh, sorry, the, the, the hitch has to rotate, whereas obviously on a Penman, the trailer lunette ring rotates. So that's the difference between these two. So it means you have to unpin the, the hitch. With it being 24 volt, um, it has to be 24 volt right the way through to the trailer as well. So all of the electrics on the trailer for the vehicle side of it is 24 volt as well. This one's got a non-standard um, jockey wheel. Um, that's because I, I believe the other one was left down and bent off in, in the military life. So they've just stuck a, a normal jockey wheel on there, which is no bother whatsoever. All it has to do is hold the trailer up. Um, it's uh, overrun brakes is how these operate. So um, basically as you brake, the vehicle compresses a piston that pushes back on a brake servo and locks the brakes up on the back of the trailer. Um, for non-military use, so civilian life, you have to have a breakaway cable that actuates the brakes as well. So that's been modified on there. Coming to the front, um, I've got a 20 litre jerry can that's uh, fixed into the front on some rails that's um, just mounted to the chassis. That is the diesel tank that feeds the diesel night heater that's inside the trailer and we'll go on that in a second. But it feeds out from underneath, you'll see there's a pipe that comes down, hits a fuel filter, then hits the, um, the night heater pump and then runs up inside to the night heater. And then we're on to the actual box of the trailer. So the box of the trailer, the idea behind the trailer was originally, um, I like to go camping and I like tarp camping. So I go out and I throw myself under a tarp and I'll do it under all conditions. However, I've got a little daughter, I've got a seven year old girl and um, she is less prone to liking going out in the rain and in the tarp in all weathers. So the idea behind the trailer camper was, I wanna be able to take my daughter with me, which means she has to be comfortable. So what you'll see inside is probably the best way I can keep her comfortable but still maintain the military aesthetic on the outside. So what I've done is I've got some extrude, extrude aluminium frame and I've bolted that down to the trailer bed uh, on the top and um, the, it reinforced with structural plates that they go around to keep the, the, the roof on. And this is 12 mil ply that feeds into each groove on the uh, extruded aluminium. So it pins itself into place and then it is bonded to the top of the trailer to keep it watertight. Um, it's also, um, wrapped in epoxy resin so um, if anyone's built anything out of plywood you know that in three or four or five years time it will the water will get through the paint it will get into the wood and the wood will just go soft and will fall apart so what I've done is I've, I've bonded the wood pre-painting in epoxy resin so it seals the wood in uh, what is effectively a hard sheet of plastic so that I can then paint over the top with some standard NATO paint and that way it should make it last much longer. And you can actually see when it rains, the water just beads off the top um, like it would on glass. Um, so it makes it nice and uh, nice and waterproof on the inside. So coming to the side, um, what I've done is I've put a, a homemade awning on the side, which is basically a tarp that um, Wilderness Adventures UK, he um, recommended a company called Tarpaflex and uh, they've got some cheap uh, canvases on the go. This is the 17 ounce canvas, about 40 quid for a sheet that's I believe eight by 10. Um, this is bolted to the rails at the top. It's got an aluminium box section at the end to keep it rigid and obviously the stands with the extra section here if I need some extra distance 
um, or it just keeps the wind off you when you're underneath the top as well. Bolted to the side of the landing, at uh, the trailer, sorry, is a awning light so I can keep it nice and bright in an evening. And uh, I usually set it up so that there is a table on this end of it and I cook underneath there. I have my chair here and you just sit down, chillax, have beers on the fire. Right, and now we're going to take a look at the back of the trailer. So um, this is where everything went into trying to make it as comfortable as possible for a seven-year-old girl. So what you'll see is that I've carpeted everything on the inside. So first and foremost, the, the idea behind the design was I needed to be strong. And originally I thought, it's a girl, I'm going to need lots of storage. I'm going to need lots of things for, for little hands to put stuff away and have everything they want to play with. So I designed it so the entire left side of the trailer is storage. Um, it also offers a support ridge down the middle that helps the, the roof stay supported. It's not free flowing for the entire span. Uh, the, obviously the center section is now supported so it means that it can do some of the off-roading stuff that you've just seen um, without racking and falling apart. Um, so we've got carpet covering all of the ply. We've got three main cabinets down the bottom and the idea is in the future that I'll be able to access those from the hatch on the outside. And we've got three small cabinets on a shelf at the top and the idea behind those is stuff, stuff, stuff boxes where clothes, t-shirts, waterproofs, anything you want, just stuff it into the top and you can grab it when you need it. Um, we've got a 100mm um, foam mattress that runs the length. It's a double mattress. We've had to, I've had to cut obviously the last section off here to accommodate obviously for access the drawer and being able to get in and shut the trailer up. Um, I am 177, sorry, one meter 77 tall. The gap in the back is um, 182. So I can lie down completely in the back. My head just touches the backboard and my toes just rub against the, the tailgate. So I, if, if I want to, I can just go on a slight diagonal and I'm perfectly fine and my daughter can sleep next to me with no problems whatsoever. Like I said, it's carpet lined and thermaled as well. So there is a, a skin underneath the, the, the carpet of uh, thermal foam that enables it to stay nice and warm. And last night I got in here without turning the diesel heater on and absolutely melted and ended up having to crack the door for a little bit. Um, and underneath the, the mattress is the drawer system. Now, I wanted a drawer system. I figured I've, I've got a lot of space all the way at the front of the trailer and I need to be able to utilize that because it's just a waste of effort. So what I've done is I've, I've dropped two 120 kilo drawer slides on and I've got a full 1.2 meter drawer that comes out It allows me to get as far back as possible. At the moment I've got tools in here but the front section is just my day-to-day -day camping gear. Here's a grab bag that's just um, waterproofs and cooking gear and food. Uh, I've got some nice shiny plates and saucers for my daughter. I've got a bag with another 24 hour ration pack in if I need it. And I've just got odds and sods in there for whatever you might need with regards to going camping. So on the left hand side I've got I've built the control panel. I figured this section here would be the best place to put all of the electrics that I need for the trailer and uh, make it easily accessible while you're standing and not cooped up inside the, uh, the trailer. So um, I've got a battery monitor there that tells me the current state of the battery. It doesn't do battery history but I don't need to know about the history I just need to know what state it's in right now. I've got a direct line to the battery if I need to charge it or if I've got any issues and I want to run something that's um, not unfused but it does go through an 80 amp breaker. And then here on the side of the trailer I've got a magnetic power port for when it gets home and it's in the winter and the solar panel can't get any electric I just plug in a uh, magnetic charger into the house and it just automatically charges the batteries. I made it magnetic because I'm I'm like most people, I'm going to just pull off the drive with it still plugged in. Um, so it magnet, it'll just pop off and it won't cause any damage. And then within this cabinet up here, this is where the electrics are. So I've got a 60 amp hour battery that's down at the bottom. That comes up to two posts. So I basically transfer the posts from the battery to into the inter internal cabinet. I've got the pass through for the solar that comes down and goes into a Victron MPPT 130 um, solar charger with a Bluetooth box. That runs back into the battery posts. This is my common negative. This is my fuse box. Um, the red light at the moment is the diesel heater. I always pull the fuse for the diesel here so it doesn't burn out the screen. Um, and I've got twin, uh, this switch panel here is on a 20 amp fuse, does the spotlight. And I've currently got four open brackets for whatever I need. Uh, this power port I use for the fridge. So I plug the fridge directly into here. At the moment, I've just got a cooler fridge, but I need to get a compressor fridge because they are far more efficient. And then I've got the neat fairy lights for my little girl, because what girls don't like fairy lights? To be fair, 
I've actually got these fairy lights in my daughter's little bunk bit at the top and I find myself using these more and more and more they don't use much energy and they're not in no. your face bright either are they that's what they that's what it's using yeah so it's, it's using next to nothing yeah. you get a lot of lights in a big space and it's not too bright so all you hardcore tactical glampers such as us fairy lights is the future <laughs> so the next transformation for it is uh, so if you move the bed out of the way you can lift one of the sections up so now i've got a platform if i need to cook on the idea is uh, so this is obviously covered by the drawer but this section here to here is open space so i'm going to cut a hatch into there so i've got some quick grab and that will probably be my food storage going forward it will just be my dry goods i can just pop the lid pull out what i want cook it in here if i absolutely must if i can't cook it out on a table um, but that gives me an option there for cooking on, on the top there the biggest thing that I'd emphasise with <coughs> this as well is this is your Mark One prototype kind of yeah, just trial, isn't it? Yeah. So, and already there's a lot of thoughtful design and very, very. This isn't the setup that I would choose, but every part of this I've been more than happy to run this because it all works and it's all thought out, which is a real nice. And, and the biggest thing as well is the one of the things. I think the biggest draw to this would be you've kept the original tub, so the cost of doing this is very very low compared to stretching chassis and building frames and all the rest of it so it's a very clever way of doing yeah, it i mean all in i've got to be i'm sub a grand all in for the entire kit and all of the the components inside it so i mean if i had to to, to mark it up the most expensive single item uh, would be the the actual mattress because you have to get that um shipped in they, they for some reason foam mattresses cost a lot of money um the diesel heater i used your code um, rich and grabbed your the diesel heater from uh, max speed in rods uh, that was brilliant um yeah I, I i would probably put the estimate at 900 quid i would say i mean on including buying the trailer yeah so if you're handy with tools this is still a similar price to the most budget of roof tents yeah. and when when you when you have the option in front of you like this and you said you've got to go in the middle of winter to stop somewhere for a a, a week you're going to choose this every single time over a roof tent because a roof tent just gives you a fold out tent and that is it and i mean the diesel heater in here it is a small small space it's a two kilowatt diesel heater and uh, you put it on the lowest hertz setting because the only way you're going to maintain this is on a hertz setting um, if you put it onto the temperature setting it will blast out hot then bring itself down then blast out hot then bring itself down so if you leave it on the hertz setting and go on 1.4 you are melting inside this because it's got it's got such good thermal insulation and the carpet acts as an extra layer of thermal um, it literally can handle the most cold weather you can think of um, and you will be quite comfortable in there. Um, I think the last things I've, I've got that are separate that I've done to this is the tailgate itself. So what I've done is I've put a, a strap on the tailgate here so that when I'm inside I can grab the strap and swing the tailgate back up so that the tailgate can close when I'm in it. And I've also put a little uh, drop down step there so that my daughter can grab the grab handle here, grab the step, pop up and get into her, inside herself. And there's um, right angle um, aluminium brackets here with a locking pin so that when she stands on it, the trailer locks into place and it, the, the gate doesn't swing underneath and, and come out from under her feet. The intention is I've got a nine by nine as well. So when I go camping with my daughter and I'm there for a longer period of time, is to dock this into the back of a nine by nine and have it open permanently so that um, I can come out and have effectively a, a living room. You, you've got a nice sealed warm living area, yeah. you've got a nice sealed warm bed area and I put money on with the size of those diesel heaters you could leave those doors open in the 9 9 and both would be very very toasty warm. Yeah, very, very warm. Finished yet, um, as you can tell I've still got some doors to wrap at the top and um, stick some um, knobs in so that you can lock closed. I've also got a little bit of carpeting to do down on this panel here just so it's out of the way. But it's enough done that I can get out, I can try it and I can see if it works for me. <coughs> I think once you've got that drop down table hatch on that side it's going to be a very 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 efficient that, setup. That is phase two. Phase two is to have this uh, section here drop down, become a table much like Rich's but it has access to the inside like a Patriot camper does. And then <coughs> this one here to have a door that opens up my compressor fridge will be stuck inside there. So there you go, it's a totally different option, very very nice option. Um, 
I like it. You know what I'm like with trailers. You know what I'm like with solid shell campers for this country. I think overall, tentage is great if you're just doing the odd camp and it's one of them things where it's, it's over nice weather. But when it comes to harsh winter and just living in a location for a period of time, there's nothing like the hard shell setup. And as you've seen, it's very, very, very well thought out. And I've watched this build uh, on Tim's Instagram, which I'll put a link to below. Um, yeah, so if you've enjoyed this, give us a comment, give us a thumbs up and share it to a group if you think it's uh, something of interest to that group. And from there, we've got a few more vehicles to run through as well as all the, uh, the camping and outdoors videos. So stay safe, thank you very much and check the description below.